guest today is Tim Fox, newly retired from the Fredericton Community Foundation. The conversation will touch on the role of charities and volunteer organizations in community, how they're funded by community foundations, and the intangible element that comes with volunteer organizations and how they build community. So many of our shared challenges are approached and solved through the voluntary sector, but we are not aware of how this happens. Today's conversation takes us much deeper into that whole process, and Tim's passion and heart are right on his sleeve. Hope you enjoy the interview. First, thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And we'll go see where we go. Okay. Um, so as past executive director of the Community Foundation, you sat at an intersection of uh, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, if that's okay, you're also um, what New Brunswickers and Maritimers call a come from away. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm a come from away, yeah. although I've been here forever. But, you know, yeah. um, it's fun to play in that field because when we hear the stories from those who chose to live here, right. an interesting perspective tends to surface and that can add to the overall narrative of the province. I think so. So how long ago did you move here and what was the draw? Yeah, it was uh, nine and a half years ago. So coming up on 10 years. The draw really was, you know, it's interesting because I went on a trip to Newfoundland with a good friend of mine. And, uh, and uh, it was life changing for me, that, that trip. I went. It wasn't because you I, kissed the cod, was it? It was partly. I did do that. <laughs> I did do that. And I did the schooner thing out into the ocean. And, uh, but really what it was is I met a lot of people who didn't have a lot of money and were incredibly happy. And for me, that was the life-changing moment. And I was uh, living in Kitchener-Waterloo um, in Ontario. And, uh, you know, Research in Motion and, and uh, Blackberry were big at the time. And there was just a, the, the community I'd moved into had disappeared. And it had become very much, um, uh, there wasn't a sense of community the same way. Um, as what I saw in Newfoundland. I went home and I said to my wife, why are we doing this? Neither one of us are terribly happy living here. Why don't we leave? And I was with the uh, Kidney Foundation of Canada at the time, and I messaged the main office and said, hey, can you get me out east somewhere? I don't really care where, yeah. out east. And um, they laughed at me and said, nobody ever leaves their jobs. And within a few months, I was out here as the executive director of the New Brunswick branch. And... And it kind of went from there. And we have never looked back. I mean, we just, we love it here. We love the people here, the lifestyle, the fact that you, you're, you know, two minutes from nature, no matter where you are. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no, there's no real cities <laughs> here um, compared to what I'm used to, right? Sure. Everything is a village. Yes. And I think that's fabulous. That's that. And I think that's what gives New Brunswick capacity to do things oddly enough people often say you know well we're too small to oh. no it's the opposite it, for me it comes up in several of the conversations whether it's um doing community development whether it's business whether it's politician whether it's healthcare delivery yeah. um there is a growing awareness that our size and scale can work to our advantage absolutely with that also comes we have to let go of the way it's always been done. That's right. So when I'm thinking specifically of healthcare, yep. there's a culture born in the 60s of every community is supposed to have a hospital. Right. But as things have changed and resources are redistributed, the regional healthcare model, as mapped out by John McGarry in an interview two years ago, really suits New Brunswick well. Mm -hmm. But he struggled against the culture of every community is supposed to have a hospital. And he saw that closeness that we had, that proximity we have, as a huge advantage. Um, but had to get over the entrenched cultural approach of how we always did things. That's right. So I wanted to drop the dichotomy a little bit, or the tensions, because that's exactly where the breakthrough will come from. When, when more people see there's more advantages to being this close together, then there are disadvantages that we used to do it this way, and now we have to learn to do it this that's way. That's right. That's right. People have to, you know, we... And it's it's natural. It's not people don't like change. They never seem to like change. You get in your comfort zone. This is what I know. This is how it works. This is how I want to do things. Um, and we see it across all sectors, right? All of society. Um, but if we step outside of that, and 
and do things differently. Try things. I mean, the other thing is, you know, we're small enough that we can get away with trying things <laughs> and, and back off without too much damage being done if it's the wrong choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, we're, we're uh, you know, we're small but powerful, but we're not one of those big machines that once it gets rolling down the hill, you can't stop it. Yeah. Yep. The, um, that comes up in a lot of the political conversations that we should be able to be uh, travel lighter, faster, quicker, more adaptable and shift. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I wanted to bring up the cultural entrenchment on old views because that's the only real obstacle left or the challenge left <clears throat> on the spirit of, of change is hard. There's this fun video clip on YouTube um, called, the, I think it's called The Play Project, but it's uh, called Piano Stairs. Look up Piano Stairs on okay. YouTube. And uh, the short of it would be that they converted a bunch of uh, subway stairs in Stockholm, I think. Um, they wanted more people using the stairs instead of the escalator. The stairs and the escalator beside each other. They turned the stairs into piano keys. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. And at the end of it, it's the hook is uh, change is possible when it's fun. That's right. So you've mapped That's out for true, us. Right? If we can just go have some fun, the change will be easier. And I mean fun in a very constructive, um, purposeful way. Absolutely. Yeah, but but I mean that, you know, I love the fact that you use the word fun because I always said work should be fun, hmm. you know, and it was my management style. It was how it's 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 what I believe in hmm. in your work, right? If you're not having a good time hmm. at your job, um, go do something else is, <laughs> is what I tell people, right? Yeah. I know it's not necessarily that simple, but really. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's important. We can do more when we're having a good time doing it, right? We all know that. Which gets a community cohesion because mm -hmm. uh, that larger conversation needs to happen for everyone to feel where, where they fit. Um, That's right. And as the executive director of the Fredericton Community Foundation in the recent past, yeah. um, you sat in the middle of a lot of those conversations trying right. to help people. And, and one of your passions or themes is how do we build more capacity with our community? So. That's correct. Can we wander into that for a while, how you see it and where we could go and how we could get there? Absolutely. So, you know, I think it takes a, it takes a shift. So I, there's, um, speaking of YouTubes, there's a, there's a great te TED talk by Dan Pallotta, right? If, um, and, and, uh, not going to remember the name of it, but essentially, you know, the, the way we see charities is dead wrong, I think is roughly how it is. People should look it up. They should watch it. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's really it's really the mantra in terms of capacity building. Um, you know, we need to take a shift away from again the traditional way of how we've done things and how we fund things mm -hmm. um, to allow charities to do their job. So every charitable organization um, has a mission, and everyone loves the mission. Oh, they do good work, right? How many times do we hear? Oh, they do wonderful work. Blah 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 blah. Yep. Um, but I don't want to support the administration of that work. Yep. I just want to support the fact, you know, I want every dollar I give to go directly to the cause. Well, who does the work? <laughs> I mean, you can have volunteers, and that's yeah. lovely, and volunteers do a fabulous job, and we rely on them, and I'm a volunteer now for a number of organizations since retiring. Yep. Right? Yep. But you need those people, those staff people who can make that actually happen and deliver that mission. And yep. the mission when it's delivered, is the most important thing that the charity does. Yep. So we need to give them permission to do that work. Yep. And so as funders, often what happens is I see two real areas that drive me crazy. So one is that, um, you know, in foundations, and I, I was really proud at the Fredericton Community Foundation that we've been moving more and more away from this and understanding that sometimes... You just have to fund the day-to-day -day work that the organization does because that's the real work, right? You don't want to make a work, a make work project for them. And yeah. But so often funders and foundations especially, both private and public foundations, will say, well, we want to, you know, we want to fund a special project. And businesses too, business foundations often do the same, right? We want to have real impact. So we want you to create something new and we'll fund that. We'll fund that new thing. That's great. But when the funding's gone, so first off, that's not the thing that they actually do. So charities now are in a position where they say, well, we want this money, but they won't give it to us to do what we're supposed to do. So we have to find a way within our mission to do something extra, and then we'll get that funding to do it. Yep. And, and that's, it's all good. 
Like, don't get me wrong. It's all good. But, geez, wouldn't it be better just to give them money to do the things that they're supposed to do so they can move forward? Yep. So that's number one. Sorry, go ahead. No, but isn't it interesting? Um, we could put that through the filter of a business case. Mm -hmm. And you can make a solid business case using that language. And in a past interview with Randy Hatfield, I played with him saying, why do we need to keep using business paradigms on a sector that has a different mandate, a different auspices, right. therefore has its own language? Yes. So why do we keep taking business language and superimposing it? So now I'm going to violate my own rule <laughs> and take the business thing and, and, and apply it. Because if you were to do a business case on charity management, you would automatically make sure your core staff are funded. Absolutely. But funny how those same people who fund, you know, give the money, will not allow that, that same principle to apply because of that emotional drive. All, all the money has to go to the kids or to the program. I don't want a single penny going to your salary. Right. Uh, squirrel moment. Um, when I ran Special Olympics from 84 to 92, I had that same conversation. It was around 86 with some car dealers in St. John. Mm -hmm. They were so passionate, uh, large sponsors of Special Olympics, new sponsors on board. It was exciting. It was much fun. But one or two in the bunch had that culture of, I don't want a penny to go to your salary. So I tried in rebuttal to, to use his business language, but to transfer it over. I said, okay, so if I'm paid a dollar, so if, if you have a sales rep and you're paying them a dollar and they're bringing five to six dollars through the door and managing all this other stuff, is that a good return on your investment? I said, it's great. For every dollar I'm paid, I'm bringing in five to seven dollars, and I'm managing this many hundreds of people with some support staff. That's what your money is helping support. That's right. No, wasn't acceptable. Wanted the money to go to the kids. And, and I didn't have anything to help with where the breakthrough come from. Right. 30 years later, you're bringing up the same dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been, it's been around forever, mm -hmm. right? It's, we, need to, we need to speak up and speak out and people need to understand that it's good business that's i mean again when we come to that it's good business it's good for business it's good for government who sometimes funds some of these charities it's good for donors it's good for everybody if we can build the capacity of the charity to do their work better so that they don't need to keep coming back to the same well yep. you know yep. so they want uh, funders will often say well we you know well we want it all to go to this special project but then at the same time, in your application, they'll say, now, how are you going to sustain that? Right? Well, you just, you just kicked me while I was down. Because I can't sustain it as a charity mm -hmm. without being able to market how good that program worked. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I can't, I need to have a marketing budget. And I know that's a, that's a dirty word, right? In, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in the donor world. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Because the reality is, and it, car dealers, it's funny, you know, because I think about car dealers. I mean, car dealers played a big, big role in the Fredericton Community Foundation, right? Yes. Well, and, and it wasn't a knock against them. I was after no. the perception. Absolutely. I, I could have picked three or four other examples. Yeah. But, but I use the car industry as well, often, when I have this conversation with people. Because how often do you see an ad for a car? <laughs> right? They're All the, the number, time. They're the number one buyers of print advertising. Absolutely, right? So everywhere you look, you see advertising to tell you about a car. They couldn't sell their cars if they didn't advertise and people didn't know that those cars were out there and available. Yep. It's the same with charity, right? Charity can't move forward if people don't know how great the work that they do is. They have to see those programs. So if I'm a funder and, I, and you're a charity and I give you money to run a program and then I ask you how it's going to be sustainable, really, in my mind, I should be saying, I'm going to give you some extra money to ensure that you can market that so that you can show people how great that program is and the impact that it has on our community yeah. and the lives that it's changing. Because then more people will say, that's a great program, I'm going to support that program. Yeah. Then that program becomes part of your core business and moves forward. But instead, the model has been, we'll fund you for a project, the project ends, there's no more money, that's the end of it. And all that good that could be, you know, multiplied thousands of times over yeah. is just lost at that point. So yes, good happens. Good for the donor or the funder. <coughs> good for the charity. Good happens then it often ends, right? Yep. And wouldn't it be better just to fund the core work that these people do and let them tell their stories? Storytelling is completely missing from the charitable industry. 
So I might have uh, pulled you off your track because you had two things. Was that the second thing? Because you mapped out the first one. Right. So one is the the first thing is is the fact that, you know, it has to go to a specific project. We don't fund core business. And then the second thing is then we don't let them market that, right? So we don't let them tell their story because, again, well, that's not going to the good of the charity sure it is and it's or it's not going to the good of the of the consumer or the good of society the the mission of the organization right yep. well absolutely it is because if you can tell your story storytelling is the single most important thing that a charity can do and it's usually the last thing on their list yes things that they do right because they're not a they're not permitted b they don't have usually the skill set to be able to tell those stories yep. right and so if we can give charities permission to tell their story and we can give them the resources so that they can tell their story, then that will let people understand what they do so much better and build support. And then they won't have to keep coming back to the same, you know, community foundation yeah. or public or, or yeah. private foundation and say, we need more money for blah, 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 because they'll be able to build that up. I, I watched uh, an interview that you, you did a few years ago, and you talked about the pot, right? The pot's only so big, but it's a pretty big pot. Yes. Right? Yeah. In this community, so here's a challenge. Here's a challenge for all the people watching this right now, right? We're in Fredericton, and in this community, there are well over 200 charities. I challenge anybody, without Googling it, to name 10. And, and, you know, and I'm willing to bet that if we looked at that list of 10, we'd see the same, you know, probably a group of 20 or so that came over and over and over again, right? Yep. Yep. Heart and stroke, cancer, SPCA, like, the, you know, and they all do, and, and don't get me wrong, they all do fabulous work, right? I, yep. I love all of those yep. organizations, but there's all these tiny, itty bitty little ones that do just as important, just as crucial work. Nobody knows they exist. And it's because we don't give them the capacity to let people know that they exist. Excellent points. So in there, there needs to be a shift in the narrative. And for people to listen or be aware, um, even though you're going to feel like you're inundated with 10,000 messages a day. But you sp my hunch is you're speaking to something bigger, which is a community's conversation with itself. That's right. Um, back in... Uh, 90s, I pitched the publisher of the Gleaner or any of the papers in New Brunswick. Why? With a new concept. And it'll tie into it, what you're doing. And, and maybe this will take root. Somebody will watch this and go, yay, there's a good idea. Let's run with it. Yeah. <clears throat> it fascinated me with why the grip and grin thing that happens. Community news, you'll see. Here's a check presentation. Um, this same stuff, formulaic. The perception from media was that this is a problem because there's so much of it that we don't have the space to show it all, which gets to your community storytelling. Right. So the paper saw something as an obstacle. Well, we can't possibly include all of them. When I saw the, uh, the publisher, I said, why don't you see that as an advantage? There's so much content there that you could create a whole section in the paper, run it like a TV guide thing, run it once a week when they used to do that, the weekly right. supplement, you know, like yeah. a tabloid style, yeah. stick it in, community news, Every organization's trying like crazy to get their message out, but they can't because they're not wired for it, like That's you right. said. Yep. You could end up having the charity cover one half of the advertising on that full page that they get, and your sales team could do the other part because um, sponsors are always saying, yeah, I'll give you this money, but I want you to give us, give us some media exposure. Right. So you turn it into a plus where this page is dedicated to diabetes. Here's your ad from the sponsors supporting diabetes. They can run a weekly column of what they've got cooking. Right. And then so your sales rep gets a full page and only has to sell a quarter page in order to get the full page. Yeah. Great idea. And then he moved to Ontario because <laughs> he got fed up, or, you know, frustrated. I'm speaking for him a bit, but he was a little frustrated with the dynamic and he wanted his career to move forward. Right. Right. That was ages ago. So that still exists. Yeah. How do we get volunteer organizations, the ability to tell their story, which will then change the whole community narrative. That's right. I, you know, and it's it's interesting because coming from southern Ontario, uh, you couldn't get a story in the paper to save your life, right? Like, you just didn't, right? There were too many people being killed. There were too many accidents. There were too many, you know, like, 
um, sensational kind of stories. Yeah. One of the great things with living in New Brunswick is we don't have a lot of sensational stories, yeah. right? Although the and media tries pretty hard sometimes. They try and they try to <laughs> they try to do that, but and I know for them it's frustrating. Yeah. For us, it's a blessing. Yeah. I mean, when the front page in the newspaper doesn't have a murder on it, yeah. I mean, this is a great place to live, yes. right? It's one of the things that just I mean, I I you know, people often talk. Oh, there's no news in the paper. Good. <laughs> that's good to yeah. me that's well, a good thing yeah but, but yeah. by news they're thinking that conflict-based news they are rather they than are. positive news right positive good news and one thing i will say about um certainly the local paper here is that over the years um as somebody in a charity i've had a lot more success getting my stories in the paper than i ever could have had you know, in a, in a different location, right? And it's it's because they are looking for content. And some yeah. of that content is fabulous stuff. And so I do think that we do have, again, we talk about, you know, being small and the advantage. That is an advantage, right? But you need to have a story and you need to be able to go to the paper with a story. And again, this is where charities often, you know, they don't have the resources to do it. They don't have the, they don't have the knowledge yeah. to know how to do those things. So yeah. as a community, we have to give them more of those opportunities, right? So I work with uh, uh, a nonprofit organization, Doc Talks, and and you know, in the last year, one of the things that Doc Talks has done is said, well, let's try to build some capacity with with charities by by creating this Open Your Eyes Fredericton concept, right? That hopefully can expand and do more things. Um, but this Open Your Eyes concept, where we will provide the resources. Um, basically in kind to produce a short film and some digital media around an issue that's important to the community and but it gives charities that opportunity to tell their story and not cost them much i'm not going to say anything they yeah. still have to put time and effort into it mm -hmm. um you know but you but the 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 idea is you give them the capacity to be able to do that you know and at this stage it's sort of one at a time but how do we build that so that so mm. that that's the common thread in the community. Mm. It's okay to tell your story. In fact, it's more than okay. We demand it. Yeah. We demand that you tell your story because people need to know the, the positive impact of their donation mm -hmm. in the community, mm -hmm. right? I want to slide in a related but slightly different direction. Sure. Back, to, back to money again and how money is donated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for the most part, volunteer organizations have grown significantly since the 80s when governments started to offload services into the voluntary sector voluntary sector grows exponentially um it's the same total amount of money though right <laughs> so it's a redistribution challenge it's not a growth challenge correct um and there's still this project mindset which you've touched on a couple times mm -hmm. so we fund projects but all of the major challenges we have are systemic from mm -hmm. literacy to poverty to um, housing you know. correct so we need a systemic approach mm -hmm. to doing that. And sitting at the Community Foundation or any of your other past experiences, what in your bones is telling you we should be doing this this way rather than that way? You've spoken to one of them, which is funding staff, right. and seeing that as, as a, the core <laughs> reason for helping right. that organization. Right. But out there in terms of impact on the different shared challenges, do you have any hunch about... Um, Tipping point was here. We should go fund that, even though no one's done that before. Well, that's a great question. Like, how do we get yeah. at literacy? How do we get at poverty and get out right. of our project mindset? Right. Part of it is part of it is um, I think is um, again it comes down to I think we often fund um, project based things as opposed to program base things um government is is funneling money out but not um governments change right governments yeah. change every well it doesn't create years, the shift right? we're looking for we've it approached doesn't. we've approached the same problems the same way for 40 years now yeah so maybe we need to change our approach yeah well we do so i was we do. wondering if yeah. you had a sense of what that might look like do the charities all need to start working together a bit more there's 200 of them in Fredericton. I think right. in New Brunswick, there's 600 some odd. Yeah, it, it, that's very true. I mean, they do need to they do need to work together more. Um, but I think again, we need to 
as funders, I think I can I can maybe best approach this as as a as a foundation, right? From a foundation end of things, and I think as a as a funder, the foundation end, what you don't want to see is duplication of services. You don't want to see the same groups doing essentially the same things in slightly different ways, hmm. right? Um, so definitely, I think there's a there's. A, and there's some of that. I'm not going to say there's a lot of that. Mm. I'm going to say there's some of that. But I think where where you know there could be great advantage um, for charities, especially the smaller ones, is if there was one payroll system that they could all use. If there was one like some of that administration that people complain about, right? Is there a way to get that so that you don't need you know? Does every charity need a boardroom? Um, probably not. Right? So how can we work with, with groups to be able to do that? And is it creating sort of a hive environment where... And we see some of that at the Victoria Health Center. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, that's not a bad, you know, that's not a bad example of... It's a good example of how, you know, there's a boardroom space there, so you don't need that as part of your, mm -hmm. what you do. But I think there's, you know, I think there's those kinds of opportunities are there to kind of cut a little bit of the the administrative costs. That being said, um, you know, it's it's really focused, it's a lot of why I think this doesn't work comes down again to the fact that we don't fund, when we give funding, especially, um, uh, especially donor-related funding, we don't give it so that they can just deliver their mission. If we would just give them permission to deliver your mission, I think we'd be able to move things forward. Literacy is interesting, though, because there's a lot of different literacy groups out there. And that's one where I would really like to see, you know, come together under under an umbrella and have some, some more strategic discussion mm -hmm. about who's doing what and how they deliver it and how it works to, to accomplish the, the end mm -hmm. goal. Right. And I, I think um, in some cases there's there's fracturing in that way. Um, Literacy is one of those areas, and you know, and I'm, I'm not an expert on literacy. I can't really speak to that. It's just as an observer, yeah. I see, I see that that's there. But a lot of other areas, honestly, I don't see a ton of overlap. What I really see is, is the money's there, if they if they didn't have to spend it on special projects and they could spend it on delivering their mission, we'd be a big, you know, it, it would be much better step ahead than than where we are. Um, related question. Mm -hmm. um, the audience might not be aware. We're talking in a very familiar way with the voluntary sector or the charitable sector. Right. Um, we both have a sense of how big that is. Yeah. Many in the audience might not understand the scale. Can you help paint a picture for uh, how many dollars we're talking about? What's the scale? What's the reach? Um, you know, because uh, uh, to help prompt it a bit, um, yeah. I've gone for years saying that the voluntary sector is larger than the other two sectors public and private combined right. yeah because it's the only sector that integrates everyone it's true so do you it's have true. your sense of of how big we're talking yeah. here whether it's measured in dollars in terms of people and in person hours um i don't but it is it is absolutely huge i mean i mean it, the the difficulty is that people don't often count the volunteer hours and the amount of volunteer time that goes into it. And it's tremendous, the amount of volunteer time, right? So when people, you know, again, complain about spending money on administration, well, my goodness, like, you look at the return on investment in a, uh, in a charity compared to a business, and the charity has a much better return on investment um, if you're just talking dollars, right? Um, really does. Um, in terms of being being able to deliver, so it, but it is quite massive because for, you know, for every two or three employees, you probably have ten times that at least in volunteers, in an organization that are working around that, right? Yeah. So the sector is huge. The other thing is, charities have, you know, and this is another pet peeve of mine. But you talked about governments downloading. So governments download, right, yep. to be smaller. Give it to the charitable sector, yep. right? Community will fix it. That's right. Community will fix it. And we'll throw a bit of money on it. Ten cents on the dollar. Right. <laughs> and that's the difficulty, right? So you see these, you, you see government, 
right? And and the bureaucrats and you know, God bless the bureaucrats. They're doing they're doing they're doing their best, right? They yes. do they work hard, they do their best that they can. They're, they're taking the money and they're putting it out to organizations, right? And this is where I will give government credit. Government often does fund core business. So good for them for for doing that. They're about the only group <laughs> the the only the only group that does but they will fund the core business but they won't fund it very much mm -hmm. so now charities have to turn around and deliver a product paying their employees twelve dollars thirteen dollars an hour if they're lucky mm -hmm. um to be able to turn out what government was turning out at employees who are being paid significantly more than twelve or thirteen dollars an hour um to be able to deliver to be able to deliver those programs, right? So for me, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a pet peeve in that um, we as society expect it. We expect that homeless people be, be, be sheltered, right? Most of us demand that. Homeless people be sheltered, that at-risk children be able to, be able to, you know, have the services that they need, that, that um, uh, people with mental health issues should be able to, to be able to, be serviced and all of these kinds of things that you know and a million other things right I mean take your take your pick whatever yep. your favorite cause is you can name it yeah and and really as a society as Canadians we're really good at expecting that all of that should be done but we don't really look at how it's done so we want it to be done we think it's good that it be done government is saying we need to downsize let's let's offload it and that's fine but you know, we're offloading it and then we're expecting the charitable sector to be able to de deliver on it. Often not with, I don't think, um, I don't think with enough sort of parameters. So when we talk about literacy, how's that being offloaded? Who is doing that? How's it being done so that it can have the greatest impact with the least amount of dollars going into it, right? Um, those are the questions that I think we need to ask when we offload, um, you know, and government sometimes, I mean, one of the other things that I, I hear very often from my friends in charities who receive government funding is, you know, the government needs to get out of our way and let us just do our job, right? So it's fine. If you're going to offload it, you set some parameters, but then, geez, Murphy, like, get out of the way, right? Let us just do our job and deliver it because we know how to do it. I've often said if, like, every deputy minister and sort of the higher levels of government, if they were all replaced by people who had worked as, as executive directors in charity, they'd be so much more efficient, right? I know I've just ticked off a whole lot of government <laughs> employees now. Yeah. But but I say that, you know, again, not to, um, you know, not to uh, disparage any any sort of government official, but I say that in that, you know, there's nobody in our community who can do more with less than people who run charities because they've proven it time and time and time and time again what they deliver they they're delivering it because government can't deliver it for the same price not even close right so charities are doing that yep. right and then we say but you know you you, you <laughs> rotter like you spent how much on administration well good lord yeah. Like, you know, it's been downloaded to them. They have to administer it. Yeah. They have to deliver it. And, you know, and I think that we also need to get to this mindset that, you know, it's not right when people in charities have to then go and use the food bank because they're not being paid enough to be able to have a, a reasonable living. You know, I often say that, you know, I often say that, look at who we who do we respect the most in society? Who gets all the play, right? And again, rightfully so. We talk about military, right? You know, they give up their lives for us and and uh, they go off and, and they, you know, do as, do as they're told, basically, and, and they give up their life yep. in some cases, right, mm -hmm. for their country. We talk about, you know, firefighters and police officers, and there's a lot of respect for those people, and rightly so. Because they are. They've dedicated their life to the community. You know, I would argue that charitable people who work in charities have done the exact same thing, right? But they don't get that respect at all. In fact, quite often the opposite. I was told once at Tim Hortons that I deserve to be paid less than everyone else because I work at a charity. Like, you know, that's fine, buddy. Like, you made the choice, right? And it's true. I did make that choice. 
But I think that we, you know, those of us who work in the charitable sector, you know, we might, we, in some cases, people who work in the charitable sector, especially in international work, do give up their lives, right? They give up their lives for the good of humanity, mm -hmm. right? Those of us in this country who work in the charitable sector, we definitely give up our lifestyle for the good of society. And I think that, that you know, that, that expectation that we should have to do that has got to, has got to stop at some point. I mean, you know, it's, it's fine. I mean, none of us expect to be paid, you know, yep. huge salaries. But geez, Murphy, like, you know, the, the folks, especially the frontline folks, are so dramatically underpaid and under-respected. There's just not enough respect for the work that they do, and that you know it 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 drives me crazy. It breaks my heart too, really, because you see them, and then we can't keep good people. What happens? And I hear this all the time from charities, right? Especially government-funded charities. So they go in. You have people. They kind of, you know social workers, um, um, uh, intake workers. You have people who are working right on the front lines with people, right? And they work and they work and they work. We can't pay them enough. And then what happens is then the government comes along and recruits them yeah. and takes them back in. Yeah. And so who benefits, right? The government benefits because they get a well-trained, excellent employee that's coming into the system, right? And who pays to retrain? Who pays the administration to retrain and get the next person up to speed? The poor charity does, yeah. right? Our foundation's a good thing. Yeah. You think so? Oh, yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Yeah. Embellish. Teach us. Yes. So, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think every, public foundations in particular, I think are absolutely fantastic things. Right? I think every community should have one. Um, the, my, my work with the Fredericton Community Foundation, honestly, it was the was the easiest job I ever had. Um, and it was the most rewarding job I ever had. And, and why are foundations great things? A uh, couple of reasons. One is foundations are donor centered, right? So as a donor, you can come to a community foundation and the real question is your money. If you're a donor, it's your money. What do you want to do? What impact do you want to have on the community? That's the first question that I would always ask of a donor, right? It's your money. Hmm. What, what impact do you want to have? And the second thing I'd say to them is, and don't be in a hurry because we're here forever. Foundations really are there forever, right? So for those who don't know how foundation works is foundations essentially take the donation in, they invest the donation, and they use the income earned on the investment as what they grant out into the community and also what pays their administration, right? So essentially, the you know you donate ten thousand dollars. That ten thousand dollars will always be there. It's the income that it earns, right? That's being used to go mm -hmm. out into the community. Mm -hmm. So the impact is not as big at one shot, but it's a long-term impact, right? It's there essentially forever. Okay. Two things. This will be more challenging but on you, but yeah. it'll bring some depth to the conversation. Yeah. Two things come to mind. <clears throat> One, when the subprime mortgage crisis hit, yeah. which it, maybe it's an anomaly or maybe not, because some in the economics world will show a pattern of when there's major recessions and right. how there's a correction mechanism. Yeah. But that Im impacts the funding <laughs> back to the community from foundations, because right. they're all investing in that in that game or in that strategy. Absolutely. Um, so there's that thought. So when you say okay. it's there forever, the perpetuity argument, yeah. um, I get most of it. But part of me still wants to um, be a little critical of, well, that depends on a certain set of things holding sway absolutely through, through a longer term. And then the yeah. second thing is, and it doesn't get mentioned as much, is um, what is the impact or benefit for the person who makes the donation on their tax returns? Mm -hmm. or, so, because in some ways, foundations take a certain amount of capital or money out of a system yep. and put it into another system yep. with this premise of long term. Yep. Um, and so there's huge value to that. Yep. But at the same time, we don't hear as much about the economic benefit for the person who made the donation. Yep. Because it'll impact their taxes at certain times. I'm thinking yep. pro athletes uh, or people who get huge chunks of change and suddenly they've created a foundation and some of it is a tax 
attack strategy. Right? It is, yeah, yeah. Some of it's so, and I'm not strategy. and I'm not doing good or bad. Yeah. There's no judgment yeah. here. It's no. just the the math and the process. Yeah, I forgot your first. I forgot the first. Well, part well, it was about, about it was about um. Now you're going to make me forget it. It was about uh, foundations and being in perpetuity. But right. subprime mortgage could come along oh, yeah. and go plunk. Right. So, and that was a problem. So we saw that in, in 2008, right? Where we had a, and uh, um, there were a number of foundations who um, weren't able to fund that year, right? Mm. And that's bad. That is bad because that's when charities might need it the most, right? Because well, donors also aren't providing yep. donations in. So... The way you do that, and the way the way that a lot of foundations do that, is you don't fund out all of the income that you've earned in that year, right? So you don't. It, it's not based on that. So it's based on a percentage, right? So you put out a certain percentage. You might be making you know nine percent return one year, but you're not divvying out nine percent. You might put out six percent or five percent, four percent that year, right? So that when you have a down year, you still have money that's been that money in the pot to be able to continue on with that, okay. with that. Funding, so you can bridge right? fund yourself. You can absolutely bridge fund yourself. Right. So it would take a total collapse, like a, a real total yeah. collapse yeah. really for foundations. And, and I mean, the reality is it's no different. It's managed the same way as a pension plan. Mm -hmm. So, right. Pension plans are very conservative, yep. right. They're built that way. Yep. Um, there's a lot of cash being held. Um, Foundations operate the same way. So what about benefit back to the donor? Benefit back to the donor, they get, basically, it's a donation. So they get a tax receipt for, for, the, for the donation that they make, okay. right, at and, the time. And what's the relationship or the scale between the tax receipt return for the donor and then the money into the community? Are they about the same? Yeah, 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 be about the same. Right. There's opportunity. I think what I, I think where a lot of this comes in is donors will um, a lot of donors give while they're alive. A lot of donors use foundations as a way to to give when they've passed. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, and and the capacity, if you gave if you gave, you know, two million dollars to a charity, there are some charities that could handle $2 million donation. There's many others who, if you said to them, I want you to set this, set up a trust, essentially, is what happens, right? Yes. Yes. I want you to set up a trust. They wouldn't know how to do it. Um, it would be a lot of work for them. Yeah. On $2 million, they're only, they're paying more um, fees to have their funds, their, their money managed than if it's in a pot of you know, $16 million or $20 million or whatever the foundation may have, right? Yep. So again, you're, you know, it's um, it's an opportunity for someone to say, and, and as a donor, so you're a donor, you love charity XYZ, you say, listen, I want, I want to support, I want to create a, a fund, a trust fund, essentially, um, that will support charity XYZ um, in perpetuity. Right, you could give it to charity X Y Z and have them do that work, which isn't their thing. Or you could give it to a community foundation. The community foundation does all the work, right? A charity still every year gets their, gets their check, gets the, gets the, and they're probably getting just as much as if you'd gone directly to them to do it. So it's just a different, it's it's a different way to do it. And charities often see the value in that. Some charities have come and set up a fund. Um, that doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the community foundation, but they're the beneficiary, hmm. right? Because, and they encourage their people to, to give to that fund because it's helping them, but they don't have all the work to do and they're not the experts in it and they can't get the same rate of return. We started the conversation by mapping out how charities are underfunded, especially in the area of core funding. Right. What you've just mapped out. Yeah. is a strategy that helps address a charity's needs and a community's focal point right. for large-scale financial management. Yeah. <clears throat> Should foundations actually become bigger as a way of offsetting the individual charity's needs for core funding? Mm -hmm. So if the paradigm you just mapped out mm -hmm. actually grew, mm -hmm. would it be one strategy for solving that core funding problem that a lot of charities have? Yes. So I would say, yes. 
Um, but it is, but it's having that discussion with the donor. And I think part of the job at, um, at a community foundation is understanding the charities, understanding the needs of the charities. Mm. I think community foundation, any foundation that doesn't have that understanding is, um, um, is not providing as good a service as they could to their community, mm. right? So, um, you know, I, I was, um, one of the things I was very proud of in my work at the community foundation was trying to get out and meet um, uh, as many people as I could get to understand the charity, get to understand what the need was, right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the need is um, they just do good work in this area and they need their core funding to be supported, right? And as you as a donor, if you have an, if an area of interest and you come in and you're not really sure who does that in the community and what they do. This is a great opportunity for me as the community foundation person to say, mm -hmm. so you want to support this kind of work in the community. Here's some organizations that do that kind of work and here's what they do, right, in those areas. Yep. What what appeals to you? And we have that discussion, right? And then you can, you can, um, you can get an understanding of what it is that the donor really wants and then lead them in that direction, right? To fulfill what they want to do with their money and at the same time fulfill that core funding need of that organization. So I think I think foundations are are very well placed to be able to do that, to be able to help people with that. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do, which again I think is um, you know, is key and one of the most exciting moments I ever had. Um, in my job at the Community Foundation was there was a project that was happening. It was a housing project that was being built. And, um, and I knew the organization well and they were doing good work and they were building a, building a project. And, uh, and I knew a donor who liked to have their name on things and, and you know, I mean, a very old style yeah. donor who liked that. But, but I felt that there was a, there was a match here. The donor didn't know anything about the organization, really. The organization certainly didn't know the donor. Yeah. Um, and I was able to bring those people together through just knowledge, right? As community foundation, community foundations have that knowledge. The people in those organizations have that knowledge. Be able to say, hey, you know what? You have a need right now. So this this was core work that they do, but it was a project as well, right? Yeah. So they needed the house yeah. to be able to house people in a housing first model, right? So here's the house needed to be built. Here's a donor over here who wants to get people off the streets into housing. Neither one knows each other. Yeah. We went in, had the meeting, you know, like many hundreds of thousands of dollars later, <laughs> right? In a matter of only a few minutes, we come out and I remember the charity um, the fellow from the charity saying to me, did that just happen? Did that, did, really, did that just happen? So those are things. So yeah, I mean, I think foundations are in a better way to do that. Foundations have capacity. Hmm. That's the other thing because foundations don't really have to fundraise. I mean, Well, it comes you know, to them. It comes it's to the structure. It comes to them, and and that's through marketing, right? Yeah. Through us being able to tell the stories of other charities yep. so i think that's the key so it comes to them yep. but it's because foundations can give themselves the permission to tell the stories of other organizations because what's the use of a foundation the use of a foundation is to build the capacity of other organizations and to show how the good work that happens in the community yep. that's that's so we're allowed to tell those stories yep. as community foundations right yep. And we can spend a little bit of money, maybe, to tell that story, yeah. and we can get that out there. So who are we helping? We're helping ourselves, because now people know that the community foundation's there, and if they're interested in, you know, and again, we're not in competition with charities, community foundations, right? We're not. So we're not trying to take the money from them and have it come over here. What we're saying is, if you're interested in the type of solution that we, we offer, come to us and it can go to any charity you wish or it can go into the community mm -hmm. right so it's yeah because that would be um the flip side of what we talked about just 10 minutes ago yeah. about our foundation is a good thing because in some ways some might perceive yeah. you're taking a certain amount of the capital out of circulation putting it into this endowment trust structure right 
for the sake of a long-term benefit right. and a distribution model that's slightly different compared to all these charities <clears throat> around the whole province are cash starved. Yeah. And the capital, the money is, and uh, large sums are going into these trust funds and being locked up and, and could be perceived that way. And then right. stuck there for a while. Right. Rather than it's not in the flow. Right. So, so, so let me give you an example of how this works really well. <laughs> Good. Um, and I'll come back to this housing project, right? So in terms of the housing project, there was, um, you know, you're building a, you're building a, a housing unit, right? You, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. there's, there's a cost to do that, right? Charity doesn't have all the money to be able to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we'd have to take out a mortgage, Right for a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. So with the housing project, here's a great model, and this is this is really to me this is sort of the epitome of how it can work. Right. So they need money now. They don't need money that's in a trust fund for years and years and years down the road. Right. But community foundations can flow money through as well. So the donor says, let's take a a, a number, a simple half a million dollars for the sake of argument. Right. For so for half a million dollars, and there's there's um, $150,000 um, owing on the building, right? Flow 150 directly through, right? Through the foundation there, boom. Now the building's paid off, right? Take the remainder of the money in the donation, put it in a fund, cover the maintenance of that building every year forever, right? That's, that's how the system can work under that. So now they don't have to worry about the maintenance of that building going forward. So in essence, yeah, you're taking that money out of the system, but it's 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 ensuring that 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 building will be there and be maintained and get a new roof and do, 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 do all the things that it needs as it moves forward in the future. And your your example is um, exceptional, but it's also out of, outside the usual uh, application process to foundations for right. money. So right. so that. Taught me then you've got several different streams of how money can move through. Not Absolutely, just, not just the the application process through the front door. We got this, and you end up competing with the other ones around, and your right. committee has to sit and select which one of these projects. Right. We've so, we've got about five minutes. Okay, five to minutes. Um, I, I like to change direction a little sure. bit. Um, thank you for all of that. This one is wonderful right. stuff. Um, My pleasure. Where where does it need to go from here? In the intersection between community, government, and business. Yeah. Because you said it that, so give us a bit of vision work about, you know, we would be better if we just did it this way instead of that way. Government needs to change these policies. Business needs to change. Can you play in that space about yeah. the next 20 years so we can get at some of those systemic problems that we, yeah. we just can't seem to reach somehow? Yeah. I think, I you know, I would love to see a, um, I would love to see an organization that really, looks after the charitable end of business, right? That helps business. One of the one of the things we hear from business all the time is I get asked a million times, right? Like all this stuff keeps coming in the door and I don't have time to deal with it. And they don't. They're running a business. Yep. That's their that's what they do, right? Um, where I see the, the businesses where it works the best are the ones where they very clearly up front say, this is what we support. This is all that we support. Don't come to us if if you're not in this, right? And I think that's fair that yep. they do that. But one of the things I would love to see is somebody take hold of that for business and businesses say, listen, we want to support our community, period, right? We want to support the community. We want to ensure that, and, and they can sort of pick fields of interest, if you will, right? I want to, I'm, I'm interested in literacy. I'm interested in child welfare. I'm interested in, and do that. But then hand that over to somebody who knows charities, right? And can say, this is where we're gonna put that money and we're gonna support core business, right? So that businesses, the core businesses of the charities, yeah, right? So that the business world understands that their money's gonna go to ensuring that the things that make our community great continue to happen in our community and build on that. So we need to build on the good that's already here instead of trying to create new good in the way of building. Does that make sense? Yes. So don't put a new project in if the core business is, is suffering, right? Core, do that first. But I think it takes coordination to be able to do that. And I think that's what miss, what's missing, right? Because, and, and it, it's, um, you know, again, coming back to a, to a, um, uh, 
previous discussion that I that I saw you have. Like, there is this area where all the asks are happening back and forth, right? And that is the area where, you know, if we could get some organization around that, <laughs> right? And again, it doesn't have to be administration heavy, no. not by any means, no. right? It just takes a knowledgeable, one knowledgeable individual who can help pull that together for groups, yeah. you know? And maybe it's a little bit funded by if each of the each of the businesses who's putting money in anyway says, you know, and imagine how much they'd save, right? Imagine time. how much they'd save in terms of time and effort time. if they could just say, you know what, we trust that, that these people will make the right decisions. We've given them our areas of interest and we're going to do that, right? And th in a lot of ways, I can see community foundations actually taking on that taking role on some of that. because they know it. The um, Slide into politics a little bit. Yeah. So... There's an election coming in 2018. We're recording this at the end of November of 2017. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see in terms of the political conversation that's going to happen during the election yeah. for integration of what we've just spent an hour talking about into an election conversation? Because it never, ever gets included. No, it never does. Boy, in, that's you a know? good question. So yeah. how, how can we get conversations about maintenance and nurturing of the voluntary sector into the political discourse of a coming election. Separate from every charity's waving its flag saying we need funding. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, more of a exactly. systemic view and a systemic yeah. approach, which is where a political yeah. conversation can facilitate that. Yeah. Rather than it's this add-on over here, we have to do these taxes for small business, we have to do these subsidies for industry, and we never get to where communities built. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And yet government's responsible for creating the environment that fosters business, which gets to literacy, poverty, housing. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. Um, geez, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Maybe, I, maybe hold a huge rally and, <laughs> and all, have all the voluntary organizations on all of their volunteers, which would be everybody when you right. put them all together. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, I think, you know, I I do I do think that actually, uh, uh, you know, some we need that visual. So when you talk about a rally, like I love that idea of a visual, right? Because it lets people know how many people really are out there. Mm -hmm. The difficulty I can tell you with doing that would be getting the charities to come out to that <laughs> and doing that, right? Because again, it's not they're busy delivering their mission. Yeah. Right, and this okay. is something that they'd have to see value in. Yeah. So I think in the discussion, though, I mean, politicians have to. There's two. Well, politicians have to realize that if you're going to download services, then you have to do it in a way that allows charities to be successful in delivering those services. And one of the ways that you do that is to, you know take away some of the bureaucracy. There's so much bureaucracy around, like, it's funny, one of the, you know, I mean, at the federal level, the federal level, one of the things that, that you see all the time is um, um, the amount of forms that charities have to fill out, right, when you're a charity. Like, there's so much of that. And then, and then the government itself complains that you're spending too much on administration. Well, don't give us so many damn forms to fill out. We won't spend so much on administration. Yeah. And I and that's the same at the provincial level. My understanding from the charities that I've that I've you know worked with is that um, you know bless them and and it, and governments do that right. They try to put all these parameters in so that they can ensure the money spent exactly the way that they want it to be spent. But geez, you're handcuffing the charities who, yeah. you know, who are small and nimble. They're all those things that we talked about in New Brunswick at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. They're creative, they're small, they're nimble. Um, they do a lot with a little bit of money. Like, give them the flexibility to do that and put some trust in them, for God's sake. Like, we just, there's not enough trust in charities. And the reality is, there's so many checks and balances <laughs> in the charity world. Like, they're not going to rip off the government. Yeah. Quite the opposite, right? I mean, it's they're going to do a fantastic job. Yeah. But get out of their way and give them the ability yeah. to do the work. And I think if we can get a government in that says, we're going to do that. We're going to trust these charities. We're going to work with them. We're going to listen to the charities. I think that's part of it too, right? Yeah. There needs to be a real listening, not a dictation, not a, you know, a, a passing down of, 
of work that needs to be done, but listen, listen to what needs to be done and build on that, right? And not just listen and do nothing. <laughs> that doesn't work either. So strategic planning is important. I'm a huge fan of strategic plans, but strategic action plans, right, that lead to action and everybody has a, a purpose and don't spend all your time on the planning, right? Like, <laughs> get her done. Yeah, good point. Um, 30 seconds left. How would you like to close? I think I'd just like, you know, for listeners to understand that, that uh, you know, we're blessed to have a charitable sector um, as large as we have and all the work that goes on. And I would encourage them, you know, to ignore the things that you hear about charities wasting money and because it's not true. I mean, so much of it is BS, right? And so much of it is based on mega charities um, uh, in other parts of the world. Um, charities in, in New Brunswick, um, they're just hardworking folk doing really good work in your community. And they need your support, and they don't need you telling them how to spend the money that you give them. Believe me, there is work to be done, and they just need your, you know, they just need your support. Thank you for yeah. this. Thank you very much. Was, I really appreciate it. Was it was wonderful. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>